I had my canoe at the offices and I got on the river quite often. Sometimes I took coaching meetings or business meetings with my direct reports out onto the river with me. So I just found that the getting in a canoe and paddling completely shifted the conversation. Welcome to the Become a Writer Today podcast with Brian Collins. Here you'll find practical advice and interviews for all kinds of writers. Would you like to write more about leadership? Or perhaps this is simply a concept that you like reading about. Hi there, my name is Brian Collins, and that's what we're going to cover in this week's podcast episode. Leadership is a concept that fascinates me. Both great leaders like Abraham Lincoln and more controversial leaders like Richard Dixon. And I've spent the past year or so reading lots of different books on the topic. And one of the reasons why I read all of these books about leadership is it's an area that I write about for Forbes. And I've written about more contemporary leaders like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and creative leaders like Twyla Tharp. So I'm always interested in how people can help others become leaders and how they can cultivate the skills that they need, you know, to succeed in their career or in their business or even with their creative work. Sometimes I'll listen to these books about leadership when I'm out for a long run. And that's something I've spoken about in previous podcast episodes because I spent the past few months training for the Dublin City Marathon. And typically when I'm out for a long run, that's a run that will take, you know, two or three hours. I will bring a set of earphones and I will listen to an audiobook from Audible about leadership or creativity and so on. And I find when I'm out there on the road, I have some time to reflect on the lessons inside of the book in question. On other occasions, my mind just goes blank and I switch off entirely. At the time of recording this podcast introduction, which is the 30th of October, I finished the Dublin City Marathon. It took place about three days ago, so I'm still a little bit sore and I'll be glad to take a break from all that training. But one thing I found is that there's a link between long distance running and writing. And it's something other writers have talked about too, because basically when you're out there on a long run, there are parts of the run that will go well and it'll feel easy, much like writing a book. And there are parts of the run where it'll just feel difficult. It'll feel like a slog. You'll feel like you're never going to get to the finish line. And you'll say to yourself, why am I doing this? And I've had the exact same experience in writing a book. The sentences will feel difficult. The chapters will feel like a slog. And I say to myself, I'll never get to the end. But I've also discovered that if I keep going, that if I push towards the finish line or if I push towards the end, I'll get there. Even if you're not into long distance running, I think it's good to have some sort of pursuit that gets you up and away from the desk or the blank page and gives you time and space where you can switch off. So that could be a walk or it could be a hobby that's nothing to do with writing or it could be some other form of exercise like cycling or swimming or yoga or Pilates or whatever it is. Because often when you're running or engaged in whatever activity you like to do, it gives your subconscious a chance to reflect on the ideas that you might have read in books, in books about leadership or ideas that you've come across, you know, in films or documentaries, or even ideas that you have at the back of your mind, but you're not quite sure how to express them. And I've often found that when I'm blocked, when I'm creatively blocked, if I go for a long run, and then when I sit down at my desk much later on, the words will come a little bit easier and I'll feel more engaged with the work in front of me. So I finished the Dublin City Marathon in just over four hours. I'm not the fastest runner on the block and I was hoping to get in under four hours, but I'm still relatively happy that I was able to get to the start line and also get to the end. And I've actually run the marathon four times and it doesn't get any easier. And that's something I was thinking about afterwards because writing a book doesn't get any easier either. And even though I've written several books, the last one, which was called This Is Working, Certainly felt very difficult at the end and I worried I'd never get to a point where I could press publish. I'll probably take a few days off before I get back into any physical training or exercise just to let my body recover and to catch up on sleep. And even when I do start back, it won't be with the same intensity. And that's probably good because I have a good bit of writing that I want to catch up on and some other work that I want to do on Become a Writer today. I also have some books that I want to catch up on and I keep a list of books that I want to read about topics like writing, creativity, productivity and of course leadership. And that brings me to this week's podcast interview. You see, I recently read the book Outward Bound Lessons to Live a Life of Leadership and that's by Mark Brown. 
He's a transformational leadership coach who works with the organization Outward Bound. That organization teaches young people, entrepreneurs and executives and so on, how they can cultivate leadership skills. And it often achieves this through outdoor experiences like hikes that last several days or camping trips and so on. Mark has recently written a book about the topic. And in this week's podcast episode, he explains why he decided to write a book about leadership, how to apply the 70-20-10 leadership model. And this was something I wrote an article about for Forbes and why interviewing other leaders and coaches formed a key part of this book. And he also talks a little bit about how he broke the book up into three acts. And the three act structure is something I always recommend to anybody who wants to write a book, particularly a nonfiction book. There's lots more we cover in the interview, but I started by asking Mark to explain what Outward Bound does and how it helps people become successful leaders. Um, Outward Bound was actually founded um, by a German-born educator named Kurt Hahn. And he first founded a school in Germany that's called Salem. And when Hitler came to power, Hahn challenged Hitler and was thrown in jail. He had some influential relationships that got him out of jail, and he ended up emigrating to Great Britain. He launched a second school in Gordonston, I think Scotland, I believe. Don't know my geography there very well. I apologize. But he ended up educating a lot of the kind of British aristocracy, including Prince Philip. And when World War II erupted, he, Han was asked to try to develop a program to give uh, young British seamen enough experience and confidence in themselves to survive in the lifeboats when their ships were being sunk in the North Sea. So that was the birthplace of Outward Bound. And it really was, Outward Bound is a nautical term, which is you know, that when a ship leaves the safety of its harbor and it's heading outward bound. So originally, Outward Bound was a nautical school. came to the United States in the early 1960s. The Colorado Outward Bound School was the first school. They are independently chartered organizations. There's an international organization still. And then the United States, there's Outward Bound USA, which is the U.S. chartering organization. So there are independent schools and centers that are all connected through this certification organization. And in the United States, Outward Bound quickly spread into the vast wilderness areas that are here, and it really became known as a wilderness school. Originally, it was young. Uh, in the 60s, it was young males. The first uh, women um, were in the late 1960s. At, um, the first school that allowed women, of course, was the Minnesota Outward Bound School, which later became the Voyager School, where I worked for many of my years. And it has evolved into many things, but essentially Outward Bound is a organization that uses mostly the wilderness, but with organizations and schools, it's changed. It's changed or moved away from just being in the wilderness. It uses urban areas as well now, but it uses that experience to really develop character in people, grit, leading through adversity and helping Outward Bound's intention is to create a more empathetic, compassionate human being that's willing to serve a greater good. So that's the genesis of the organization. It has grown into all kinds of ways, adapted itself. And it's also birthed a lot of other organizations like the National Outdoor Leadership School, Knowles in the United States, was started by former Outbound instructors. The Association for Experiential Education, I think you could make the argument for you know anyone who's ever been on a ropes course anywhere that that came out of the original training of getting young seamen up in the you know up in the uh, mass high mass of sailing ships and things so it's it's really our bound has impacted experiential education it's really the grandparent if you will of the whole experiential education movement and now it's really you know the work i did well over a decade was almost all organizational change work so leadership development team building communication, programming, and some of it was wilderness-based, some of it was actually internal-based, but it uses the same principles. One of the wilderness-based activities that stood out was climbing Kilimanjaro. I think that's mentioned in one in the book. Yeah, so that was actually a, um, an organization that was started by an, an Outward alumni named Rue Mapp, who did a mountaineering course in California when she was a young woman. And the lessons of her experience impacted her significantly to a point where she ended up launching this organization called Outdoor Afro, which is intention was to get African Americans to lead other African Americans out into the wilderness areas. And one of a group of her leaders that she had trained decided to plan their own trip to Kilimanjaro, which uh, they became the first African American, solely African American group to summit Mount Kilimanjaro. 
So one thing that struck me was Outward Bound's motto, which comes from the Alfred Lord Tennyson poem, Ulysses. And could, could you just describe the motto? Right. So the motto is to serve, to strive and not to yield. And that is adaptation from the Tennyson poem. And it's um, really is the, the backbone of everything that Outward Bound does. So they're, those are really um, their, their ways of thinking or operating in the world. When I set out to write the book, um, Outward Bound Lessons to Live a Life of Leadership, I was struck by how everyone I was talking to interviewing referenced the motto, how much it had, had impacted. And these are not all former leaders of Outward Bound. Many of them were participants. So they had come on corporate courses or leadership development courses. And we're talking, you know, 20, 30 years later, they're quoting that motto. So I think it has a strong impact on people. And what does it mean to serve, to strive and not to yield? And I know this is the, the core or what I think is interesting is this is how you structured the book as well. The book is the way I describe it is it's the impact that former leaders and participants in Outward Bound have, have had in the world. So really looking at how Outward Bound affected them and then how they took those lessons out into the world. And so when we were interviewing them, we kept hearing referencing to to serve, to strive and not to yield. And the book is a co-publication with Outward Bound. So I, I did all the interviewing and writing and they were also helping guide the, the writing of the manuscript. And as we were talking, it made logical sense that that became the framework of the book. And so when we talk about serving, we're really looking at to be an impactful leader in the world, to make sure that you're serving a higher purpose than just the business structure of an organization, if you will. So certainly businesses need to make money. Businesses need to make profit. Believe here that that's not part of this, but I think it's it's a both and. And what we know of lots and lots of research has gone into this, businesses that pull this higher sense of purpose, leaders who pull people to this mission focus of serving others, um, create better workplaces, workplaces where their workers will um, actually produce more, where there tends to be less accident rates, better health outcomes, turnover goes down. All these things come from creating a sense of mission. Uh, one of the people that I talked to in the book was the founder of the Home Depot, Arthur Blank. And he talked a lot about creating that sense of mission when when the Home Depot was new and young. And I did, I did training within um, Home Depot for Outward Bound. And I, I saw it firsthand. I saw this passion. They call it bleeding orange in Home Depot. People were so passionate about the work. And that came that came right from the founders. It was their own passion that's showing up to um, to serve their communities, to serve their employees, to make a good place to work. And Arthur Blanks continued that. He, he used the same framework. He owns the Atlanta Falcons now and he also owns the Atlanta United soccer team. And he uses the same framework to lead those organizations as he did the Home Depot. And his foundation work, he's really working to, to eradicate poverty in, um, in Atlanta where he's headquartered. And, and it's the same it's the same approach. It's that really service orientation to kind of that. There, there's that saying that, you know, to, to, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think that that really, that's a reflection of, um, of serving as a leader. And on a classic Outward Bound course, I mean, that's what you're doing because you are out there with, you are out there with the participants. So if it's pouring down rain in the wilderness, you're getting soaking wet with them. If it's hot, if there are mosquitoes swarming you if you're in a swamp, if you know you have a 30-mile paddle day or a 20-mile hiking day, you're right in there with them. And you are not only going through the adversity of the expedition, but you're also, you know, you're in service of making sure that they stay safe, that they learn the skills that they need to learn, et cetera. So that, that really is the framework of that first part to serve. Yeah, it's the second part to strive. Yeah. You have yeah, an interesting so model inside of that. Yeah. And so striving really looks at one, getting crystal clear about as a leader, what your values are. And so standing in that place of truth. Again, one of the one of the participants that I interviewed was a former United States Senator, Mark Udall, who started his adult career as an Outward Bound instructor and later was the executive director of the Colorado Outward Bound School. And then his second career was politics. He, he became a state representative, then a U.S. congressman, and then a U.S. senator. But he talked a lot about he was serving when 9-11 happened here in the United States. He was serving after that when 
There was the run up to going to war in Afghanistan and then going to war in Iraq and the expansion of the um, NSA in the United States. And like there was a lot of, you know, I think our country was rightfully so injured or wounded from the attacks. And there was a lot of reactionaryism about us wanting, you know, retribution and things. It was part of the, I think, the response to feeling attacked. And yet Mark talked about his values and conscience telling him that we need to slow down, think through this. Attacking Iraq has nothing to do with what happened on 9-11. Like he he stood in Congress and he said, you know, it was it was a it was an incredibly difficult thing to vote against the mood of the day, but my values told me this was not what we should be doing. And I had to stand in that truth. Even if I I might have lost re-election, I got attacked by, you know, my political opponents. And yet he knew it was the right thing to do. And that's really, that comes out of that striving mentality of not, not giving into the easy way or the, you know, the, the mood of the day, but standing in that truth. And also striving is really knowing that on any expedition, on a wilderness expedition, you hit places where there's adversity, where it gets hard. That's where the learning really grows within um, what I call expeditionary leadership. So that's my that's my description of what happens in an experience like Outward Bound. So in expedition or leadership, it's really the moment, those moments of adversity, those moments of difficulty when the greatest learning and strengths of the individuals in the team happen. So rather than avoid the adversity, you, you lead into the adversity. So it, it's pretty apropos for right now because I was working in the car business and I still, I consult with the car industry and and the disruption within the industry is intense. And the way, the traditional ways that people have practiced businesses, business for almost 100 years may not even exist 10 years from now. So there, within that rapid change, that adversity that comes out of it, you need this kind of leadership model because there's huge opportunity here for leaders who can help unleash the human potential of their teams. And that's really what this striving piece is about. It's focusing on your team and your own growth when you're in the hard spots, knowing that that is the place of opportunity. One example that struck me in that part of the book was the 70-20-10 model. Is that a model from Outward Bound or is the interviewee relating that to her Outward Bound experiences? So that was Laura Kohler who talked about that, who is the descendant of the Kohlers that founded the Kohler Company, which is, produces mostly plumbing, bath fixtures, tubs, sinks, toilets, that kind of stuff. And I would call it an adaptation. In expeditionary leadership, we built this same model. In a corporate setting, I think it's an acknowledgement that the greatest learning, that 70% learning is going to come in that experience. So what I would call in launching the expedition and using my language. So in taking an employee in a company and actually first preparing them, but then launching them into a project that is beyond the scope of what they've ever done, oftentimes beyond the scope of what they know they can do. In Kohler, there are champions that support those people that they put in that that 70%. And that's where their real growth and training and development as leaders are. It's in that 6 to 12 to 18 month long project that that person's leading, that they are learning real time as they struggle and as they take on a real world challenge. You know, they're typically these projects are aligned with the company's larger goals. So they take on this project, you coach and train real time in it as opposed to the 2010. So the other 20% is coaching and then 10% training. So those are more of the formalized structures. So if you think of like I ran a I ran a internal coaching program for a number of years in my last company. So that 20 would be people coming to my office and sitting down, you know, once a week or once every two weeks to go over their progress, look at the performance stuff, get feedback, that 20% formal coaching. The 70% is me actually out there with that person watching them, waiting for those moments of hardship, I'm championing them when they do good things, helping them learn through the adversity. So it's, um, you know, what, what in the our bound world, we would call those teachable moments. So as a leader, you have to think of yourself as a teacher and you have to be watching and waiting for those teachable moments when that person may struggle. And it could be it could be a technical skill challenge. More than likely, though, in leadership, it's more an interpersonal challenge. So when they face that adversity around 
Um, it may be conflict within a group. It may be rallying a team to stretch themselves beyond their known abilities. It may be, you know, something happens in the marketplace that causes the organization to need to respond quickly. That that's the time as a expeditionary leader, you need to be present to that 70% focus. And Kohler sounds like from talking with Laura, that's something that they've really adopted into their company. And that's allowed the companies had huge, I mean, it's a hundred plus year old companies had huge growth the last you know, 10 or 15 years and almost no turnover. I mean, people don't want to leave that company. And, and it, it's partly because of that kind of a culture. It's very engaging as a young leader. Again, I did this with my teams as well. When they get, when they get a project that, and you support them. If there's not a trusting environment, this is not a good model. But if you build that trust, they know you have their back and then you stretch them into this place where they didn't know they were um, capable of doing it. One of the mantras in Outward Bound is that you can do more than you think you can. And that's our job as leaders is to help people find that, find that in themselves. And the other piece of it is just that we need to do it together. So again, when you go on an expedition, you travel always at the speed of the slowest person. You never leave someone behind. And as a leader in Outward Bound, you're always you're looking for those teachable moments. And 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 what people don't necessarily think about as adversity, most people consider rock climbing as that's a scary thing that's going to lead to adversity. Or whitewater or the, the risky activities are usually the things people um, think are going to be the most difficult. But often it's living in a group of people for 24-7, for three days, four days, a week, two weeks, three weeks, depending on how long your expedition. But imagine, you know, again, I, I would take these leadership groups. So imagine a company of young leaders, and now they're thrown into an, a wilderness expedition together. So suddenly they're not going home at five o'clock. And not only that, but someone's decision as a young leader may affect all of their peers. It may affect whether they get to camp on time or how difficult it is, the route that they pick, all these things. So it, it's pretty intense, the interpersonal development. So how do you coach people to manage conflict in a situation like that? They are, they are again, you as a leader, you are waiting for that because you know it's going to come up. And it's the opportunity. So the activity always is secondary to that learning. In that moment, you stop the group and you you know, we call always, we always talk about circling it up, you know, you circle up the group and then you, you begin the process of, um, live time coaching. Some leaders will set up a charter ahead of time, which is always a good idea. So you set some rules of engagement, you know, before you go out on the expedition. And then the first time it hits, then you can ask that question like, okay, we agreed together to be respectful to each other. Was that comment that you just made do you think that was respectful? And then the person who was directed toward, how did that feel? We intensely talk about every experience. Every experience that happens is um, debriefed afterward. The day is debriefed. So the end of the end of every day on our bound expedition is a is a debrief of the day, often using a simple plus delta model. So what worked well? What do we need to improve on? So um, if you're using a leadership rotation to people who, and again, these people have never been out in the wilderness, they have no experience in it, but they're asked to leave the group for the day. And then the next day, that leadership will be handed off to two more people. So you may do a plus delta to hand over leadership lessons for the next group so they can do better the second day. And then you'll debrief. And then the next day, that leadership is handed off again. And as, a le- as an outward leader, your job is to make yourself irrelevant. If you do your job well, then the group can function completely without you. And groups can actually get there really quickly. Within a few days, a group can operate. It's never been in the wilderness, can completely operate in the wilderness without, without a, an outward bound leader leading them within a few days. I do some of these groups who are new to these experiences find it stressful? I would say almost everybody finds some part of the wilderness stressful. So some of them, it may be, it may be the sleeping on the ground. It may be the weather. It may be the activities. Um, you know, if you look, particularly with adults, if you look at um, most people, for instance, haven't backpacked before. So put a 30 or 40 pound backpack on your back. Oh, I was leading in the North Carolina mountains. So we're going to go see that mountain over there. We're going to be on top of that tomorrow. 
and they've never climbed a mountain. They've never carried a backpack. And not only that, but you're going to lead, you're going to lead the expedition, not me. I am not your, you know, this is, this is not a, a guiding trip here. I am not guiding you. I'm going to teach you how to lead out here, but you're going to be, you know, they, they cook food, they set up and tear down camp. They run the crew. You know, we teach them how to run these meetings so that they, they learn to debrief the learning themselves and pass that leadership on. And that's all part of the teaching that happens at Outward Bound. So yes, most people find that stressful. And I think though most people, what is challenging for them is just living in that type of community because people aren't used to that. And there's no distraction. There's no cell phones and there's no texting. That, that, that's all put away. So, wow, yeah, that sounds quite hardcore. Um, would you not be concerned people would get lost? Well, you're with them as a leader and they often do get lost, but you're with them. So you know where the crew is at all time. You're not separate from them, but you don't yeah. correct that. You don't correct them if they go off course because that becomes part of the learning. That must require a lot of patience. Again, you have to learn to focus on the moment and not if you're focused on the outcome then it can be really distracting but if you're really focused on the moment you actually want those things to happen but yes i would say empathy patience good listening skills being really present to interpersonal stuff that's really the art of a really good outward bound leader is that those abilities it's the and, and you know i've been away from them for a while but i just did an event last week in miami and there was a group of current outward bound instructors there. And you see the same thing. It's a presence of a very humble, but strong presence in these leaders because they're, they're very skilled at the kind of human world. Being empathetic really is a pretty strong key to being good at that job. And, you know, the, there are pillars in outward bound and the final pillar, if you will, um, is there's compassion and actually saying always was above all compassion. So I was really taught in the years that I worked at Outward Bound to always hold that, you know, people are inherently good. They have this inside them and you're, you are leading them toward that. And so if you don't have that mindset, this is not the kind of work you would want to do. And the, the last part of the, the saying, um, not to yield, you know, and I think really we've addressed that some here, but I think that that is the ability to continue when things get hard to put people always at the front of the equation to lead through when when you can't really clearly see where you're going when people are filled with doubt when there could be an easier path to take that's when that not yielding really shows shows itself mm. did it take you long to to write the book well <laughs> you could say to actually the actual writing of it was about a year, but I, I first sort of outlined this concept. I went back to graduate school and got a master's in business in 2005, 2006. And I, I kind of first penned this. I took kind of the principles of the wilderness and put it into an organizational change setting and sort of penned the first outline to what I call expeditionary leadership. And then I got the opportunity to join the leadership of a company. So I went inside and, and before that I was working as a executive coach and consultant. So I was doing this work, some with Outward Bound, some on my own, and applying these principles to my work, but I had never kind of gone inside and done a full, full-blown full change. So I had, the, I had the opportunity to come work on a, you know, a, a fourth generation, 90 plus year old owned family business. And they hired me specifically because of my Outward Bound background. And they really wanted this huge culture change within their company. So then I went inside and actually ended up leading in this and over time ended up, you know, being asked to take over some departments. So, you know, was running sales departments and marketing and digital communications and training and development and really seeing these principles go in place. And and I kept thinking to myself, I'm surely not the only person doing this who came out of Outward Bound. These are this is a natural skill transition that I think there must be other people who had this impact because I was a, I was a participant first of that were bound. That's what drew me into it. it. It so impacted my life that I wanted to go do that work. And uh, I found Bear Kohler, the publisher. We talked a little bit, and they were really encouraging about the book. And they asked me to get Outward Bound involved. That took a little while to, because I wasn't working for them. But once Outward Bound was on board, 
we started interviewing people and spend about a year talking to people. And that's when I really, it really inspired me to see some of these amazing leaders who really took the lessons from their experiences of that rebound and, and really turned them into pretty large impact in the world. And, you know, some of them significant leaders like Arthur Blank that a lot of, you know, the, that most of the corporate world is familiar with, but then a lot of silent leaders out there who maybe teachers or maybe they're environmental activists, but it's this, they're using the same principles. And that's what I think really struck me of how, how much one that these folks care for the people around them and how they really, they kind of approach leading a little bit differently. And that's the, to me, the real, the real magic of our bound. And finally, Mark, do you have an ideal early morning routine at the moment? I do some quiet time when I'm up in the morning. So meditative time. I've had a meditative practice now for almost two decades. And then I, I don't get this every day, but I get outside as many days as possible. So I would say four or five days out of a week. When I was in New England, I was fortunate that our offices were right on the Merrimack River. So I actually had my, I had my canoe at the offices and I got on the river quite often. Sometimes I took coaching meetings or business meetings with my direct reports out onto the river with me. So I just found that the getting in a canoe and paddling completely shifted the conversation. So I did that a lot. And, and I will walk or hike um, regularly. I get in the boat when I can now. It's not, it's not as often, but on, on most mornings, at the very least, I will get out. I'll get up at first light and go for a walk. It just helps me to start my day that way. Mm, I like the idea of a meeting on the canoe. <laughs> it's you know these little things are really they're really impactful for people to just shift that. And I know we introduced we introduced the just changing how you meet with people as part of the organization, and not not everybody in the company was going out on the river, but a lot of people were going for walks with their direct reports and things. And and it really it just affects the dynamic versus sitting in an office across the desk. And I think it's really important if you're going to connect with people and really lead them then you know to shift that dynamic so that it doesn't feel like you you are a boss but that more that you are that caring compassionate person that's there there for them and something as simple as a walk outside can make a big difference so where can people find the book or more information about your work mark um so the book is for sale on amazon.com barnes and noble indiebound um, a lot of the independent bookstores as well. Barnes and Noble had had it out as an initial display when it was released, but you can get it on the shelves in most of their stores around the country or order online. And my website is markmbrown.com. And it is a, really a chance if people want to go just learn more about what I call expeditionary leadership. And if they're interested in either exploring change leadership in their company or they want to understand more about the principles and how they can be adapted to an organizational setting. There's a lot of resources there. Thank you. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. If you did, please leave a rating on the iTunes store. And if you want to accomplish more with your writing, please visit becomearitertoday.com forward slash join and I'll send you a free email course. Thanks for listening.